Good morning, Marty, and happy 2023. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing well, Joe. Again, uh, when I hear 2023, I kind of pause and think, wow, really? <laughs> but I guess we are here. Happy New Year. Yeah, happy New Year to you. 2022 went by really, really quick, it seemed. Uh, but hey, this is the first podcast of 2023, and, and today we'll be discussing the business and technology behind intelligent robotic solutions. And in order, in order to do so, we're going to be joined by Brandon Coates from Musion Corporation. Brandon is the Director of Integration at Musion, and over his career, he has developed a strong foundation in first principle thinking, problem solving, product development, and engineering organization development. So, uh, hey, Brandon, how are you doing this morning? Again, happy 2023 to you. Yeah, um, great to be here. Thanks for having me, Joe, and then happy to talk a little bit about tech today. That's awesome. So as I mentioned, uh, today we're going to lear learn a little bit more about Musion Inc., uh, which is a robotics intelligent company that makes any robot more capable, efficient, and reliable. And we're going to learn more about that and just how they do that in today's podcast. So to learn more about Musion Inc., you can visit their website at www.musion-corp.com. Again, that's www.musion-corp.com. Dot com, and to spell Musion is M-U-J-I-N. All right, let's get right at it. So, Brandon, uh, you've been on the Musion team now for what nearly two years. Uh, how about you tell us a little bit more about yourself and how your career path landed you at Musion? Yeah, sure. So, I uh, I am an engineer uh, first, so mechanical engineer. Um, Got my bachelor's from University of Louisville and then went on to start a Ph.D. at Purdue. Um, and then along the way, I realized that uh, what I was studying there, I was not so interested in. It was like fluid fluid mechanics and cardiovascular modeling and all of that was great. And it was one of the most challenging things you, see you can do as a mechanical engineer. Um, but it, I just fundamentally wasn't aligned with what I was doing. So um, had a buddy that uh, came over, uh, came down from Michigan to school and he was at a robotics company. And he, uh, he said, hey, you should join this company. And then, you know, basically uh, kind of sat on that for a few weeks and then uh, ended up jumping on it. And then, uh, you know, basically 15 years later, uh, not really looking back. So it was, it was the right decision. So, um, you know, for anyone that's listening that might be a little bit earlier in their career, uh, robotics is definitely um, one of the most exciting fields that you can be in as an engineer. Yeah, so uh, kind of along the way, um, I've worked uh, with software companies, I've worked with integration companies, and uh, on the manufacturing side, helped to deploy systems for companies like Airbus and Boeing, um, as well as uh, deploying factory uh, digital solutions for companies like uh, General Motors and Chrysler. So automotive, aerospace, and then uh, more recently in material handling, um, with a company known as MHS, Material Handling mm -hmm. Systems. Mm -hmm. So they're a top 10 material handling provider globally. Um, basically uh, cut my teeth there when it comes to material handling and then uh, quickly became the product manager responsible for robotics and vision applications for the company. So through, uh, through that role, I actually uh, came to know Mujin. And so I, uh, as a robotics guy, as a technology guy, um, I regularly track companies, and uh, part of my role was to basically spell out who we should be working with. And what I found um, out of about 30 companies ranked by attribute is that Mugen was so far ahead of the competition, it, it really didn't make sense. So um, that was the conviction I had at the time, and uh, after joining, being here for two years, I can only tell you that that conviction has just gotten stronger. So... Oh, awesome. It's uh, great to be with a very innovative robotics company. Yeah, I'll tell you, the first time I uh, met Mugen was at uh, the Modex show back in March of last year. And I gotta tell you, I was really impressed. Uh, number one, the demonstration was fantastic. Uh, but just the technology, the advancements, it seemed to be uh, well ahead of what I've seen from other companies in this space. So, yeah, I was very intrigued and, and certainly I wanted to make sure that I learned as much as I could and then hopefully pass that on to my team and, and, and hopefully find ways in which we can use that technology uh, to help our customers within the markets that we, uh, you know, that we pursue. So, yeah, great, great to hear. Uh, so I just want to take a step back. When I read a little bit about yourself, 
I, I noticed you said first principle thinking was uh, one of the key phrases that you that you noted. What what is first principle thinking in, in your mind? Yeah, it's it's being able to uh, to come up to a problem uh, statement and to to really spell it out and understand. Um, as you, you dig down to like the core of the problem, um, trying to figure out a, a solution uh, that should be developed. So um, there, there's a general issue in industry when you're in the innovation track is that once you have geared up a company and geared up a product, it's hard to change the direction of that. And actually, um, this is a really big problem um, because once you build that product up, what ends up happening is that... Um, uh, that innovation kind of goes away. And then as it goes away, um, then you're running into issues with um, just sustaining the innovation over time. And then sooner or later, there's going to be a company that's coming in and uh, will we'll basically come and eat your lunch, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's just the way technology evolves overall. But first principle thinking is being able to really break the problem out into the individual pieces and then coming up with a solution uh, that should be there. And it may not be a solution that's ever been done before. Right. So what, one of these things that you get is, um, you know, having people that want to come in and they use the tools that they've already understood to try to fix a problem. Um, and it might not be the, the most optimal or the ideal path forward. So being able to break it down, is very, very important um, all the way down to like the level of the like chemistry or something going into the, the plastic of the product, for example. Right. And if you don't have that first principle uh, basis, then actually you can make a lot of wrong decisions uh, that will lead the the group and the company astray. Right. So, mm. so you, you break it down into those break it down into those pieces, right? And then you find a solution that then can pull those pieces together, and then you have a much more robust solution to offer. Yeah. So I think most most engineers today they get this uh, a little bit when they take a design course at some point, maybe as they're uh, a senior. Um, with their undergrad, you start to get into this and dabble. Um, so we, we know things like, um, you know, working with a design matrix, for example. And so you, you have all of the um, attributes of the system that you want to optimize for, and you'll look at competing solutions to that. And this is a, kind of an example of doing some of this, uh, you know, first principle thinking, but it can actually, actually get much uh, deeper than that, um, especially when you start to intertwine the various engineering disciplines um, if you have a good uh, uh, foundation in physics and mathematics, actually, that's most of what you need. And then from there, basically, all of the engineering disciplines are uh, commonized, right? And then we, we actually get very specific to mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, software engineering, and so on and so forth. Um, but if you have a very good uh, foundation um, in, in STEM, basically, right, math and science, and you're going to be able to uh, excel in all of these different fields. Yeah, sure. So then that being one of your core attributes, uh, Musion, I would imagine, fit right into that bill. They, they kind of follow those same principles. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Okay. So uh, knowing, for example, when you're going to deploy a project, um, when it's appropriate to take on a little bit more um, and basically innovate on the fly, um, and then throttling that to the point that you're not you're not betting the farm on the deployment that you're doing, but you're taking the next natural step uh, with the innovation of, for example, we might do a, a gripper and we do individual vacuum control on our grippers a lot of times. And so for us, you know, uh, five or six years ago, we're doing, you know, three or four channel uh, grippers. And then if you look at how we've progressed today, we're, we're doing grippers that have 64 individual channels, right? And so I, I would imagine over time, that's just going to keep increasing. But you can't just increase uh, the number of channels here because your complexity is increasing. And then also your, your cost is increasing. And as your costs mm -hmm. increase, then you're not going to have the willingness to pay for them from a uh, customer. So you need the value of this over time. But then at the same time, uh, you've got to be able to go back in, um, take standard industrial components, kind of reverse engineer them and then be able to uh, build these up in house um, so that you can actually drive down the cost. So that, that's one of our main goals here is driving up value, driving down cost. 
Great, great. So we're going to get a little bit more into that, the, the driving the value, the, the cost and how you go to market. But let's just talk a little bit about what makes Musion an intelligent robotics company. What, what's what's behind that, the secret sauce of the company that, that makes them this robotics intelligent company? Sure. Yeah. So I, I think the uh, the core of the technology that we've got uh, really lies in a, a real-time digital twin. So... Um, it's a real-time digital twin that's also rooted in, in uh, autonomous path generation and motion planning. So in order to do uh, motion planning, the, the traditional software that's out in the world, first off, it tends to be offline software. And so when you program a robot in manufacturing, for example, you're going to generate a tool path and you'll do it through a CAD CAM software. Um, once you're happy with uh, basically all the features you're extracting from the CAD data, you're going to go and translate this to the controller language, download and basically parse out the file, and then you're going to feed that into the specific robot to execute. Um, with Mujin, what's a little bit different is that these programs go away. So uh, the robot is able to um, understand the scene that's around it in 3D. And then uh, basically this forms a set of constraints from which you can do autonomous path uh, generation. So all of that uh, previous tool path generation uh, that you would do um, leading up to this point, basically this is on the table now for us to automate. And uh, having deployed these systems into companies like Airbus and Boeing, I can tell you that uh, after you get the software in and they're using the software, then it becomes a sustaining effort to go in. You have to have a uh, basically a program of uh, engineers to go and um, update the toolpath on a regular basis. And you're going to have a very small model change. And when you change this model in one specific area of a very large part, basically all of these features that are wrapped up in this CAD data, they're, they're driven by UUIDs, universal unique identifiers. And so if one changes, actually they all change, and then your toolpath goes out the door, and then you're stuck right. there selecting all the edges and the surfaces again, and it's just a really tedious effort. So I'd, I'd like to imagine a world where uh, this type of um, engineering uh, expenditure can be automated, right? And we can get more productivity out of our solution. So um, at the end of the day, that's that's kind of where we're focused, right? All right. Interesting. It is pretty interesting, Marty. Um, and how you do that and, and yet maintain that robot agnostic, right? Because it's it's any robot manufacturer that you're able to integrate your solution with, correct? Yeah, that's right. So the, um, the, the technology that we've developed more than anything is really a software technology. And then that software technology is riding on a, uh, a robot controller. So this is a controller that we've designed uh, in-house, and we, we have a contract manufacturer that's actually building it for us. Um, it's a universal robot controller, so it'll plug and play with any make and model of industrial robot. But then it doesn't even need to be an industrial robot. It can be AGVs. It can be anything that has servos on it, right? So you think about a kinematic chain. Uh, and so whether it's a six axis robot, a robot on a sled, a robot on multiple sleds, or it's a, a five axis gantry, for instance, right? Or a Cartesian wow. machine. Um, any okay. of these, um, we can go back and we can control these devices in real time. And then we add to them this uh, basic low level sense of perception of what's going on in the scene in 3D, right? So that they can have uh, this autonomous path generation capability. Um, so with that comes features like collision avoidance, Right. And I, I've spent a lot of time in the field and I've had issues where end of arm tools don't end up making it uh, making it to production. At least the first one doesn't because you're setting it up and something goes wrong during the setup and then you end up destroying a tool. And so this is another uh, path to, to value generation is that we can't path plan through obstacles. The, the technology mm -hmm. and the software just won't let you do it. Hmm. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah, back in the day, I, when I would program robots <laughs> in my early days, yeah, I've, I've gone through a, a few tool, a few tools here and there with uh, crashes, especially with multiple axes and things like that in the arc welding world. Yeah, it's not a pretty sight. So that's pretty interesting. Um, so let's get into a little bit about how Musion goes to market and that whole the value proposition, because you do have the value, uh, you do have some value add, but how do you take that? product value add to the marketplace today right so the uh the, the primary uh path to market will be through integrator partners um so as, as we come to the the u.s uh, we've been in business in japan for uh, 12 years and as we come to the u.s here 
Um, we, we know that what it takes to uh, get into uh, these uh, manufacturing sites and logistics sites is really having a, a great network of integrators. Um, these are the partners that are going to be able to build up the full turnkey solutions. They're going to be able to do the, the contract labor and uh, dealing with um, all the, the burden that comes with that, that a technology company really doesn't want to go in and, and to, to learn to, to master and to scale up. So, for instance, um, something like going out and generating permits, depending on which, uh, which state, which city you're in, um, that's just not something that a technology company wants to go through. Right? We want to focus on this product that we're developing. So um, our primary path to market will be through an integrator network in the U.S. Great. Yeah. Joe, if I can jump in. Sure. <clears throat> I'd love, uh, you're, you're, you're a relatively new company, Brandon. Um, you know, even back in Japan, I mean, what, how did you get that growth so rapidly? Uh, how, how did that happen? What's the brains behind right. this? What's the marketing behind this? I, I'm fascinated because you're a new company, relatively speaking, right? Yes, yeah, so we, uh, we think of ourselves kind of like a startup, right? But at the same time, a lot of startups that are out there today, they have maybe uh, three or four years of experience, whereas we have 12, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we were a little bit more on that side of the spectrum. So the, uh, the story uh, behind Mujin really has to do with uh, our technology co-founder, so uh, Ross and Dianka. So Ross, uh, Ross went to UC Berkeley for his undergrad uh, and master's degree in electrical engineering, and then he went on to Carnegie Mellon to get his PhD in robotics. And so our, our core technology was actually developed during this uh, PhD. And then he, uh, he knew he wanted to start a company. And so think back about uh, 2010, 2011 timeframe, right? Um, he was uh, spent a short stint at Willow Garage. I'm not sure if you guys know uh, the reference to Willow Garage or not. Spent a short stint there uh, in, in, uh, also in Bay Area. And he realized that the, the market for this advanced robotics product that he, he envisioned for the company the market wasn't right in the U.S. The investors weren't really there back in 2010 to put money into this mm. type in, uh, of endeavor. And then when he started to do tours and visit the major robot OEMs in the U.S., um, he didn't get a very positive response, right? Mm. Right? Mm. Yeah, you're you're going to do what with the autonomous path generation? And how, how does this work? And you want to control our robots in real time? Like, Right. Um, these, these APIs and SDKs that allow you to do real-time motion control robots, um, back in that time, they, they didn't exist. And right. so when he realized all of this kind of coming to get, uh, together and connected the dots, he realized that he would have to be in Japan, right? And so mm -hmm. he, he jumped mm -hmm. on a plane and uh, went over to the University of Tokyo and started a short stint there. And then as he recounts the story, he never actually worked on the research that he went there and was hired for. Uh, fortunately, his advisors were, uh, you know, very agreeable to this. And uh, actually, Mujin was spun out of the University of Tokyo shortly thereafter. Um, so that's the origin story of the company. And then, uh, you know, how we move so quickly. I mean, Asian supply chain has a lot to do with it. But then the type of people that we hire, the, the high energy and the, the passion uh, inside of individuals to want to jump into robotics, which is not a not an easy industry to jump into, right? Mm. I, I think this has a lot mm. to do with it as well. So we have just very committed people within the company. Wow. Okay, Joe. Yeah, so you know, tell us a little bit about some of the applications that you guys get into. I mean, is it, do you strictly like depalletizing, mixed case, uh, rainbow palletizing, thin picking? I know they're all on the table, I think, but what do you like to focus on? Right. So I'd say uh, globally, or uh, let's say in, in, uh, in APAC um, countries, it's probably everything that's pick in place, right? So we, uh, we think of our technology as generalizing the, the uh, pick in place motion for industrial robots. So whether that is in a manufacturing setting, whether it's in a logistics setting, um, we kind of uh, run the gambit of all the, the um, applications that are out there. So in manufacturing, you're going to get things like um, metal bin picking. So you might have a CNC machine that's spitting parts out into a bin. Mm -hmm. 
And then at some point, uh, traditionally, there's an operator that has to pick these pieces out and then feed them through the downstream process. So we do that with, uh, with robots, right? Um, we can also do machine tending, right? So you'll see us doing machine tending applications as well. Um, and then you have all the logistics applications. Now, in the U.S., as we gear up the business, we're really focused on logistics um, more than anything else. So um, within logistics, where we're focusing here is basically um, any of uh, piece picking application, um, order kitting application, which very few companies can actually do. Most companies that do piece picking, they're like picking up a part and then just dropping it in a box without yeah. any order to how they're dropping it and, and packing it in. We actually do the packing where we understand, like if we're dropping to a shipper box, that we're placing the first item here and we're going to stack a part on top of it and another one nests up against it. So all of this, we, uh, we kind of understand we have a standard solution for. And then from wow. piece picking, we get into uh, palletizing and depalletizing. So whether it's single skew, multi skew, um, we can really do uh, any of these. And then these are the standard solutions that we have standard UI flows for. Um, of course, we do the, the ones that are a little bit more custom as well. It just depends on what the customer need is. Yeah, yeah. yeah Marty. This... Uh, Joe, if I can ask a question. Oh, yep, go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, to dovetail into that, Brandon, I'm looking, I guess it's at your website there, and I'm going to read something. It says, we're starting in the warehouse, helping logistics operations address major long-term challenges, finding and retaining labor. Next sentence. Because when robots take on dirty, tedious, or dangerous risks, risks available labor can be deployed more effectively. Is that what you're seeing? Is that what you're talking about? Is that the gig, if you will, <laughs> or at least one yeah, of them? Yeah, I think all of these applications I just mentioned, um, when you look at what they are in a warehouse or a factory, I mean, this is, uh, mm. this is really low-level work that you wouldn't want to hire people to, to actually do it. In fact, um, the, the labor pain here is that you can't find the people and you, you can't staff up to actually yeah. do it. And then when you right. do staff up, you end up having high rates of turnover. So that, that is what we're seeing. And uh, that's one of the reasons we're focused on these applications. Yeah. Makes sense to me. Yeah. Back yeah. to you, Joe. Yeah, it absolutely <laughs> does. And, and we're seeing the same thing. And that's what attracted me to the, the Mugen uh, product portfolio was, you know, we're trying to focus more on this order fulfillment in the logistics, warehousing, uh, you know, that type of, of workflow. And uh, so just so we have a clear understanding of what Mugen uh what they offer and how far do you take the the value add i mean so when say we're we're going to be an integrator partner what do we acquire from mugen as a partner yeah so i think it really depends on the the uh the readiness level um of the integrator so uh typically if we're doing a custom system which is most of robotics out there up to this point uh, especially within warehousing um, these custom solutions, the integrator uh, is going to look to Mugen to provide uh, sample layouts. So we'll give feedback and guidance on what the overall layout with respect to the robot might look like. We'll show how these robots fit together within a warehouse and how they, they communicate. Um, but then in terms of what they're actually purchasing from us outside of that more like service uh, oriented item there is the, the Mugen hardware controller, the pendant, and then the software application that they, they want to run. Um, the other items you're going to get are basically uh, grippers that, uh, you know, basically we have over 40 standard grippers uh, within our wheelhouse. And so we oh, wow. keep iterating on these and increasing the number. Um, so standard grippers, and we do also custom grippers, and then also uh, vision systems as well. So we're kind of uh, the way we're agnostic mm -hmm. on the industrial robot side, uh, in the AGV side, we're also agnostic on the sensor side. So really any um, sensor technology, whether it's 2D or 3D or whether it's um, anything else, all of that can come back and communicate through the Mugen controller. And so this control, um, kind of big picture what you see is it kind of acts like a, a PLC that does all of the coordination of all the devices within a uh, work cell. Um, but that's basically what the integrators are, are getting from us. Okay, so we could actually purchase a what we call function package that it's ready to deploy for a specific application. Right. And then we take that function package and just develop it out into the full turnkey solution delivered to the client. 
Right. Yep. And then we have to find some happy uh, middle ground, like who installs the robot, who procures the the riser for it and all of this stuff. All of that is uh, is open sure. for us. We'll do it if it's needed for the integrator. And then um, there is one other uh, option that we can do, which is we're moving uh, in this direction in the U.S., which is a productized solution. So we'll actually take the entire uh the entire uh, solution will we'll make something like a quick kit, which maybe you saw at the last trade show that we went to for depalletizing. So we'll put it on a base plate that's easily forkable. Um, we'll put all the fencing on that. We'll put the vision systems on that, the controller, the cabinet. And then this becomes something very easy to go out and deploy to a customer site. So um, this is also an option for uh, integrators as well. And then uh, what we're finding is it gets them... Uh, basically uh, a foot into the door with an end customer and then they can go in and figure out what do you actually need for the the overall solution, right? Usually something where you're going to sure. test one or two robots and see how the technology is working would be a mm -hmm. great uh, reason to go this direction. And then uh, they can go back to the custom solution and scale and roll that out. Sure. Yeah. Those type of solutions where they're uh, functional packages or solutions that make your way pretty far down the value chain are kind of attractive to PSA. Uh, it allows us to work with our partners really well, uh, collaborate uh, and, and engage the customer and us as partners. But then it also doesn't burden our engineering staff and you know all that difficult, right? And, and all that hard. So this is re really interesting. Marty, I'm kind of excited to hear about this and uh, yeah, yeah, I can tell actually. <laughs> Yeah, my my mind. I'm taking I'm, notes. I'm sorry, my mind is like just spinning here, just thinking about you know a number of well, we, things. Well, we, we you probably want to start to wrap up, yeah, and I, I yeah. typically we typically like to say, well, this is the your whole company, Brandon, is a success story. Your personal story is a success story at that company. But is there anything that you'd like to point to in the last few months or a year that? Uh, Maybe you just mentioned about it, that kit. Um, is there a success story you want to share with us that uh, beyond what we've already talked about? Sure. I, I think uh, a lot of the work over the first couple of years in the U.S. is um, basically going out and uh, starting early relationships and, and gearing up uh, the business for what what's to come in the following year. So um, we can see that in the, the years ahead, um, where we're looking is basically program orders of robots. And so... Um, finding the right integrators and the relationships to pull that off, I think, is uh, very, very important. And a lot of this uh, has been laid out uh, over the last year. Um, so uh, mm -hmm. being able to work with, uh, you know, great integrators across the spectrum. So whether it's a, a shape process automation um, that is, uh, you know, they deploy a lot of FANUC systems every year, or whether it's uh, an RG group um, that is more on the side of like doing quick robot, quick bot type deployments, right? Um, a lot of these relationships have been um, set up and formalized over the last year. And then we're excited to announce these as we get into uh, trade shows uh, moving forward. And then I guess uh, the very exciting thing for the year ahead is going to be looking at some of the new applications that Mujin is working on now um, as these hit the uh, the trade shows. So um, I think I'll leave it as that. So these are applications that have never been done before mm -hmm. that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what everyone's awareness is, it's impossible to do. And I think this year you're going to see that we're actually pulling this off. Well, that's so, it. Joe, in the industry, they call that a teaser. Yeah, it's a teaser. You know? It's a teaser. <laughs> it's a teaser. <laughs> well, Brandon is teasing us. Stay yeah. tuned, he's saying. <laughs> yeah, and, and Brandon, I'm really looking forward to getting engaged with uh, your leadership team and, and the sales channel to understand how uh, PSA and Mugen can can work uh, closer together here in, in 2023. Uh, I think you have a fantastic product. Uh, sky's the limit here. So I'm really excited about it. Uh, so let's uh, ha tell us how we can get a hold of you. Uh, you know, learn more about Mugen. Tell us how we can do that. Yeah, I think uh, you, you stated it right at the beginning. Um, so if you need to uh, contact us, you can contact us through the website. Uh, so that's www.mujin-corp, mujin-corp.com. Fantastic. All right. Thanks a lot, Brandon. I really appreciate your time this morning. Yeah, Brandon, thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, appreciate Marty. It. Appreciate right. it here.